Not one note. I think we better all stood up on the chairs and get that little extra, right? Thank you, Tanya and team. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kinmount Baptist Church. We're in the book of Daniel still. I figure I tried to figure it out this week how long it'll take us to finish Daniel. Thankfully, it's not five years like it did take us in Luke, but hopefully we're going to be done by the end of January. We'll see. We're in chapter 9. We're in chapter 9. It's been a precious study in this wonderful, precious book. I've entitled today's sermon, The Future of Israel. The Future of Israel. Isn't it amazing how through the centuries, thousands of years, Israel has been the center of the world? It's been the center of the world. In the redemptive history of, of God, of, of the world itself. This little tiny itsy bitsy nation. The events of the world center around it over and over and over. And the world's focus even today centers around this little nation called Israel. Why is it so important? Why is this little country so important? Well, we've been studying Daniel. And if you've been with us, you realize that we, we've brought up a topic that very few pastors will talk about, and that's the indignation of God. We've, we've taken a look at this indignation of God. God's righteous anger against his people. And we've talked about that at length, and we've seen it. And why is it there? Well, because of their disobedience, because they haven't been doing what they're doing. They brought in idol worship, they murdered their babies, they just deny God all through the centuries. I mean, you study the book of Judges, and man, I'll tell you, at the end of the study of Judges, you're just wiped right out. God in his mercy brings a prophet and, and the, the cycle continues six or seven times because they'll do a little bit of repentance and they'll repent until the, everything comes back to reasonable normalcy. And they're blessed again. And then they start to sin again. And they go into that cycle where God gets peeved off with them, brings in another prophet, messes them up, gets them back on track. And it goes on and on and on and on. I'm not going to get into it. I haven't got time to get into it. And you follow it all the way through the Old Testament. And poor old Daniel, he thought this 70 years of captivity was it. When it was done, God said, no, 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 it's not done. He doesn't say it, but he implies it. It's just getting started. It's just getting started. We've also seen in our lifetime as we've studied the New Testament the rise up of what we call the church. God calls his church, his bride. That's you and me, folks. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're part of the church. You're part of the bride of Christ. You always will be. And we've seen this. From the time of Jesus' resurrection right through to the rapture of the church, this, this pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That's the church age, we call it. It's called the church age. Paul calls it the mystery. The mystery. Amazing stuff. This thing called church. And what's happened through those, from, from the church on right through, what's happened with Israel? Disobedient to God. It continues, and it continues, and it continues. And yet, they hang in there. Israel hangs in there. Probably one of the most secular, well, it is, one of the most secular uh, nations in the world. Highest rate of abortion in the world. They thumb their noses at God, as at Jesus, as Messiah. I just heard Ben Shapiro. Anybody have heard of Ben Shapiro in one of the greatest, uh, what do you call those things, uh, platforms you got on, on the Internet? Podcast, that's right, thank you. What do you think of Jesus Christ, Ben? Well, he's not God. Not only that, I, he's not even a prophet. Thanks, Ben. Off you go. That's Israel today. 
And yet, we're hearing wonderful, wonderful things from Israel. How many people are becoming Messianic Jews, we call them. Hey, he is our Messiah. Jesus is our Messiah. And they're turning by the thousands, by the thousands. And Mark just reported this morning and yesterday she told me there's millions being saved in Iran. In Iran. God's at work. God's at work. So Israel. God's indignation toward Israel, his righteous anger toward Israel is valid. It continues to be valid. And we got it in chapter 8, uh, verse 13, I believe it was, where the indignation of God was mentioned. It's been going on before this, and it's going to continue, Daniel. It ain't over after the 70 years captivity. It's going to go on until Messiah comes back the second time. When he comes and defeats the last empire, Gentile empire on this earth. And we find this again in chapter 11. It's going to go on. It's going to go on. And we see it today. The anti-Semitism is there. It's there. It's on our streets. We don't get arrested for that. We get arrested for saying, Mr. Trudeau, I don't want the vaccination. That's what I get arrested for. My bank account gets stymied. But you go ahead and protest against Israel, no problem. You put up a Hamas flag, no problem. Okay, I'll stop there. The question I have is, is God done with Israel? Is he done? He's peeved off with them. We've known that for centuries now. Daniel prophesies it. He gives it to them. He's done. No, he's not done. He's not done. 1 Samuel 12, 2 tells us this. The Lord will not forsake his people for his name's sake. For his name. Not for Israel's name's sake. For his name's sake. What are you talking about? Because God's reputation is at stake. What do you mean by that? He has bound himself. God the Father has bound himself with the Abrahamic covenant. You go back to Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17, 19, and 22. Over and over and over. God made the covenant with Abraham. And God will keep his word. Amen? He will keep his word. He will keep his word. He will keep it. Psalm 89, 30 to 37. Don't take time now, but write it down. Psalm 9, 4, or Roman, Romans chapter 11. That's, that's a key point when you're talking about replacement theology that some of our fellow so-called Christians really buy into, that the church replaced Israel. Paul says, no! Not a chance. It's impossible. God kept his covenant, not with the church, with Israel. With Israel. Jesus in his all of that discourse, basically he says this, it's going to get worse. But the Jewish people will be restored. They'll be restored. Remember, it's God's name that's at stake. We saw that in chapter 9 earlier. It's his word that's at stake. It's his reputation that's at stake. It's God's. It's God's. The truth of his word. This little country, this little tiny itsy bitsy country, should have been wiped out over and over and over and over again. It's amazing. And yet we know from studying his precious word, he's got a marvelous plan for Israel. And that history, as brief as it was these last five minutes, has unfolded in Daniel, this precious book called Daniel. Chapter 9, quick review. Daniel's on his knees right through to verse 19. He's praying for the folks, for his people. He knew that they had turned against God. That 70-year thing, how did that get started? Well, back in Leviticus, back in, in, uh, in Leviticus, we find out that you're supposed to not work the land more than six out of seven years. You're supposed to give the land its Sabbath, Israel. 
And in the beginning they did. And then they stopped. Once again, disobeying God. And he says, okay. They did it for 490 years. They disobeyed God. He says, okay, you owe me. You owe me 70 Sabbaths. 70 weeks of years. Amazing. It comes to 490 years. You owe me. And I get tingles up my spine when you multiply it out and it's, not, it's 490 years. What's the big deal? Well, you're going to for 70 years, you're going to go into captivity and the land's going to get its Sabbath. You're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And that comes out of Jeremiah. You can go check it out. That's how this links up with today, what we're going to talk about today. Daniel knew about this 70 years captivity. He'd gone to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah had prophesied this 70 years captivity. And this is punishment. This is, this is part of the indignation of God, his, his, his anger with his people. And so Daniel thought at the end of the 70 years, it's going to be over. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. No, Daniel, no, it's not. And in this prayer, Daniel was praying, God, please do what you say you're going to do for your name's sake. For your sake, do what you're going to do. Do what you've said. And that prayer, as I said, went right through to verse 19. And then we come to verse 20. I want you to be honored, God. I want you to be honored. So we saw the circumstances of Daniel here. And then we saw that Gabriel shows up. While he's praying, while Daniel's praying, Gabriel shows up, the archangel. Verse 21. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision previously, if you remember back in chapter 7 and 8, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Daniel's praying. Gabriel interrupts him. And he tells him, listen, Daniel, pay attention here. We're interrupting you for a reason. While you're praying, we remind, we're reminded by God that uh, you are highly esteemed in heaven. You are greatly beloved in heaven. And so listen, Daniel, you're going to get a prophecy here. I want you to pay attention. And that's what last week we named that. We, we titled that. I'm not very good at titling sermons. Pay attention, Daniel. Make sure you get this one. Make sure you get this one. So while Daniel's praying, God's moving. He's moving. He's moving. He communicates this message, and I think it's the greatest detailed prophecy in the whole Scripture, this message that's coming to Daniel for his people. Daniel, he gets upset when God's mocked. He gets upset when the people are suffering. He's getting hammered both ways here. He's in prayer. God moves. God communicates directly to Daniel through Gabriel. So I want you to turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to pick it up today. I think I'll read uh, from 23 on of chapter 9. At the beginning of your supplications, your, your prayers, Daniel, the command was issued. I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Pay attention. Give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. And here we go. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. And it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end where there will be war. Desolations will be, are determined. Verse 27 says, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week... He will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. 
one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. A brief moment of prayer. Father, guide us, please. Direct us in this. Make it clear to us what you'd have us learn today for Christ's sake. Amen. Last week we took a look at that verse 24. I wanted just to remind you, six things have to happen for Israel's sake as we come into the end times. And here they are listed in verse 24. This is a key verse in Bible prophecy in the Scripture. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people, the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to do what? To finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Daniel, there's going to be a period of 77s. And we saw last week that that was 77s of years. I won't going to go through all that again. You can look at last week's tape. And that turns out to be 70 times 7, which is 490 years. That sounds familiar. And this block of history, at this point in time, had yet to come. It hadn't happened yet. The 490 years of future history had not happened. And what's going to happen? What's, what's going to happen regarding Israel? Well, he tells us back in 24. Sin's going to be finally dealt with. And the one I love the most, well, of course, I like that one, but the one I love the most is, is going to be eternal righteousness. That means permanent righteousness is going to be established when the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ is established. So when did this 490 years begin? Verse 25. Take a quick look at it. Get your pencils out. You'll want to mark some of this stuff. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, pardon me, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. A decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? When did that happen? Well, we are so privileged to know. There's no dispute, even by non-believers. The historians have gone back, and they know the exact day that this happened. And we find out about it in Nehemiah chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you want to have a great study sometime, you've never studied Nehemiah, do it. Do it. Nehemiah is the guy that rebuilt the wall. He, he, he headed up the team to rebuild the walls. While Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes at the time, the king of uh, Medo-Persia. You remember the story of Esther. Anyway, Artaxerxes was the king. In chapter 1 of Nehemiah, he's praying and praying and praying to God. By chapter 2, Artaxerxes gets up and says, go back and rebuild it. Go back and rebuild it. Go back and restore it. Jerusalem. By the way, Nehemiah, I'll give you some letters here. You just give the letter to these, these cities as you go. They'll, get, they'll make sure you got your materials. It was 600 miles away, by the way. You had to go 600 miles back to Jerusalem. So in the history books, you can go and find out. In 445 B.C., 445, March 14th, 445 B.C., Artaxerxes said, go back, rebuild, and restore Jerusalem. Okay. The 490 years begins with Artaxerxes. Okay, Bruce. When did it end? Well, thanks for asking. When did it end? Well... It tells us, what does it say? From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild until what? Messiah, the prince, there will be those 69 weeks, 7 weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza moat even in times of distress. Until Messiah, the prince. You remember when we started this, we said you're going to see two princes. 
And the first one is Messiah, the Prince. Until Messiah, the Prince. What happened? When did Messiah get declared Messiah officially? Does anybody remember? Oh, am I, I'm not teaching in a classroom here. Okay, so if you remember the prophecy of Zechariah, Zechariah said he's going to come down, he's going to be Messiah, he's going to be on the colt of a donkey. And do you remember when that was? We call it what? Palm Sunday. So he's coming down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. He looks over Jerusalem and he weeps. Remember that time? He knows what's coming a few years later. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed a few years later. He comes down and they're calling, this is our king, this is our Messiah. He's coming in. They're laying down the olive branches and all these palm tree branches and everything else calling Jesus their Messiah. What's the big deal there, Bruce? Well, the big deal is how long later do you think it was? After the 69 weeks. The 69th week, 483 years after Artaxerxes gave the decree, Messiah was declared in Israel. Wow. To me, it's a wow. It's a wow. 483 years into it. And, and of course, it was divided. I think I told you last week, if you don't remember anything, well, did I say that? If you don't remember anything else, it's divided into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. The first seven weeks is the first 49 years. What happened during the first 49 years? Guess what? Jerusalem was rebuilt in those first 49 years. And then the rest of the, the time up to the 283-year mark, the Messiah is going to be coming. The Messiah is going to be coming. And then at the end of that, of course, that's when Messiah was declared Messiah by the Jewish people that week, that day. That's amazing to me. So we're at the end of 69 weeks here. And Messiah is declared. I could get into more details. I'm not going to get into more details. This, this, folks, is an amazing prophecy. Verse 26 tells us, and listen to, listen to this. So after the 62 weeks, which is actually 69 weeks because the seven's before the 62. Now you've got the 62. And after the 62, what? It says after the 62. So this stuff doesn't happen during that time. It's after that time. After Messiah has been declared. Is that important? You'll see it is important. We have the 69 weeks here. So everything here up to this point that's going to happen is after the 69 weeks. After the 483 years. After the Messiah is declared Messiah. What does it say after that? After the six, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Cut off? Messiah will be cut off. And you go back into the, into the Bible, Genesis 9, 11, Deuteronomy 20, 20, Jeremiah 11, 19. Those are the only three I could find. And the word for cut off means killed, destroyed, cut off. The interesting thing to me is after, the, after those 62 weeks, Messiah is going to be killed. But if you study it properly, if you studied the Old Testament properly, as many of those rabbis didn't, you can see all the way through. And there's many different references to the Messiah dying. As a matter of fact, it, it, it had prophesied Messiah being crucified before crucifixion was even invented by the Medo-Persians. Can't go there today. It's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. Leviticus 7.20, Proverbs 2.22, and Psalm 37.9, not only is he cut off killed, they speak of him being executed as a criminal. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to be killed, and he's going to be killed like a criminal. Who does this sound like? Amazing. Pretty specific prophecy about our Lord Jesus. Daniel's saying, 69 weeks, 483 years are going to pass. 
And after that, and it's exactly to the day. It's exactly. Have they counted the days? Yep. You want to hear what the days are? You can write this down. 173,880 days later, he comes in on the full colt of a donkey. Amazing. March 14th, 445, right through to April 6th, A.D. 32. What does it say after that? I got to keep going here. Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. What does that mean? Well, he has nothing for himself. Jesus died on the cross, folks. What he deserved, he wasn't given. He wasn't given love. He was not given respect. He was not given honor. He was cut off. He was killed like a criminal. Nothing. He got nothing that he deserved. The Bible tells us he came unto his own and his own received him not. He was in the world, that world that was made by him, that world knew him not. Nothing. He got nothing. Well, he got one thing. He got my sin. He got your sin. It was put on him by his Father. That's what he got. He's executed as a criminal. He gets nothing he deserves. Okay, what happens next? And it says this, and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after the 69 weeks, after the 483 years, after he's cut off as a criminal, what happens? It says this, the people of the prince that shall come. Well, who's this prince that's going to come? Well, we already talked about this earlier on. The prince that is to come is the little horn of chapter 7. The prince that is to come is that willful king of chapter 8. That guy that they call the, the king of fierce countenance in chapter 8. We nickname him the Antichrist. So we have the Messiah Prince, capital P, and now we have the people of the prince that is to come, small p, Antichrist. Antichrist. Well, who are the people of the prince to come? Well, if you've been with us, we've been studying in the book of Daniel. Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8 talks about the empires. And we know the empires, the times of the Gentiles, at 21, uh, 21 verse 24 of Luke talks about the times of the Gentiles. What's the times of the Gentiles? You should all know this by now. It's the time where... Jerusalem is not controlled by Jews. It's controlled by Gentiles. It started in 586 B.C. You know this. Babylon. Babylon. That's just before that, Daniel had been taken into captivity. So he's been there all through these 70 years. So Babylon was the first one. 539, Babylon's defeated by the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians, they, they take over the world. They take over the running of Jerusalem as well. And we know in 331 that the Greeks defeated the Medo-Persians. Remember Alexander the Great? And they, they take over the world really quickly. They take over the world. And then in 63 B.C., the Romans defeat the Greeks. And the Romans, for four or 500 years, they run the world. And then they kind of go into hiding in the sense. They were never really defeated. And we've talked about this. And they rise up again when? At the end. At the end. Who's the Antichrist? Well, we talked about him being the final ruler of the final form of the final kingdom. Remember that? The final kingdom being Rome. The resurrected Rome, if you will. It's going to happen. I believe it's happening right at the moment that I'm speaking. It's happening right now. So who are the people? The Romans. We would call them the European Union right now. These same ten nations, they're gathered together. That used to be the Roman Empire. They're part of the whole shebang now. And they're going to be the one, ones that uh, Antichrist leads. So this prince that's to come will be leading them. But before that happens, what happens? 
They destroy Jerusalem and the sanctuary. The people of the prince that's to come, the Romans, destroys Jerusalem. Now, when did that happen? You remember 70 A.D.? 70 A.D. Jerusalem's for five or six months. A guy named Titus. Finally, he, they, uh, Nero appointed Titus. Then Nero committed suicide. We won't get into that. Titus becomes emperor eventually. But they came to Jerusalem and destroyed it. And destroyed the sanctuary. Where did we read that? We just read it. So that's what happened. Absolute destruction of Jerusalem and the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Verse 26 talks about it being a devastating thing. I'm not going to give you the details. I have a hard time reading through Josephus. Josephus, the great historian, the Jewish historian who lived through this period of time that we're speaking of right now, 70 A.D., he describes it. It's one of the books that I have in my office that I won't loan out. You can come and read it if you want, but you must stay in my office. This is a precious historical book. And Josephus will give details that just makes you shiver of what happened during those months. He addressed it. He lived it. I want you to turn with me quickly, very quickly, to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 20 says this. This is Jesus. And he tells the Jews, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies and recognize that he, pardon me, that her desolation is near, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. Why? Because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to the people, to this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's going to go on and on and on. It really gets started in 70 A.D. Jesus addresses it. Daniel had prophesied it. I'm going to give you a couple details, even though I wasn't going to give you one that really intrigues me. Before this happened, there was a forest outside of Jerusalem. And I guess it was a, a wonderful forest. It was literally destroyed. Why? Well, they needed the wood for what? Building ramps, building catapults. They had to attack this wonderful city. The major reason it was destroyed was to build crosses. They ran out of wood. They crucified so many people. They ran out of wood. Historians tell us, though, that it was starvation that killed most of the people. Mothers eating their own babies. I, okay, I'll stop there. Total de devastation. It didn't end there, folks. After the 70 years... In one day, the city of Damascus killed 10,000 Jews by slitting their throats. And then you go through the history books and you find out about the Gladiator Age and, and the First Crusade in 1096, the Jews were massacred. The Second Crusade in 1146, same thing. 1290, Edward I of England ordered the Jews out of England. Same thing happened in France, 1236. 1348, the Black Death. I remember reading about that in, in high school. The Jews were accused of poisoning the wells. And many of them were killed, but a lot of them fled to Russia and fled to Poland. We find many years later how a lot of Jews were in Russia and Poland. 1894, again, it happened in France. They got wiped, well, not wiped out, but they were persecuted badly. And, of course, you all know and have heard of, in the 1940s, over 6 million 
or slaughtered by Hitler. You see, after the 483 days, the Messiah will be cut off. Then there will be desolation in the land. And it became desolate. Something happened in 1914. Getting a little closer to our time now. 90,000 Jews got together and said, let's go back. Let's go back to this land. 1914. And by 1948, and you've heard me talk about this before, they were declared by the United Nations as a nation again. So what's happening? Well, I think it's a setup for the end times. I don't think there's any question about it if you know your prophecy at all. The prophecy is not complete yet. There's still one week to go. The 69 weeks have been completed. All of this stuff has to happen now. It has to happen now. Verse 27 says this. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Who's the he here? Well, it refers right back to the prince who is to come in verse 26. That's who it is. Antichrist. He's going to make a covenant with many nations, including Israel. Including Israel. And he does it. He does it. He's going to do it. That last week begins when that covenant is signed. And we've talked about this in the past many times. Ezekiel tells us Israel is now going to feel secure when this happens. Antichrist is going to protect them. He's a nice guy, right? No, he's not a nice guy. He's not a nice guy. Those first three and a half years that he has in power, he's going to bring peace. The Bible talks about him being a great, a great orator. He also, in Revelation, it talks about him coming with a bow but no arrows. He's coming. He's going to make peace without war. He's going to have the answers to it all. And Ezekiel also tells us they won't bother building walls around their little villages. They're being set up. They will be set up. I believe, and this is Bruce Mason's opinion, there's a very good chance that he will help them rebuild the temple. They figure four or five, maybe six months to rebuild it. They're, just, they're ready right now. They're ready to go. And Christ comes in. Let's get this all straightened out. Let's, we'll help you out. Yeah. Yeah. Remember this. He's a liar. And he is getting his power from the dragon, from Satan himself, who's the father of all lies. In the middle of the week, it tells us in 27, three and a half years in, he breaks the covenant. He breaks that precious covenant that he'd given to Israel and others. Amazing. Do we got time? Do we got time? Do we have time to go to Revelation? Uh, let's go to Revelation. Just for, just for a minute. Revelation. It tells us in verse 4 of Revelation, they worship the dragon, that's Satan, because he gave his authority to the beast, that's the Antichrist, and they worship the beast, the Antichrist. Who is like the beast? And who's able to wage war with him? And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for how long? Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. And if you go down to verse 11, it, it talks about his sidekick. sidekick. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercised all the authority of the first base beast. He's, a, he's what we call, is called the false prophet. That's his sidekick. And it's him that sets up an image to the beast. So you had to either worship the beast, Antichrist, or the image of the beast. And we know with technology today, that ain't going to be too hard. You're all going to be able to see this image of the beast. Those of you who are here, I, I won't be here. I trust you won't be here either. But, what does it say? If you don't worship the image, or you don't worship the Antichrist, the beast, you will be killed. Period. No questions asked. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that he sets himself up as God. I'm God. 
That's what he's going to say. And all hell is going to break loose for the Christians, if there will be Christians, and the Jews especially, after that period of time. It's interesting to me also, and I'll not take any time on this, but he has no problem with the harlot church. There will be a church all the way through the tribulation period. But it won't be a believing church. It's going to be a harlot, chapter 17. So when you get to chapter 17, you're going to find out that he's had enough. He tolerated them right up until 17. Why? Why does he destroy them? He destroys the, the harlot church. That's chapter 17 and chapter 18 of Revelation. That's a great study, but it's a long study. Why? Because you're not allowed to worship anything or anybody except me. That's what he's going to say. He'll be killed. And he does. He wipes them out. No worship. There will be, con uh, verse 27 tells us there's going to be complete destruction. Complete destruction until the end, the finish of the seven years. The next three and a half years after he breaks this covenant are going to be horrendous on this earth. We can't even really imagine how bad it's going to be. The Holy Spirit has been not, he's not restraining any sin at all. The church is gone. The true church is gone. We have people getting saved. That's okay. But the church is gone. And all hell will break loose until the end. Is that the very end, though? No. Go back to verse 24. Back to verse 24. We talked about something that has to happen. Has to happen. Where am I? Verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your holy city and your people to do what? Finish the transgression, make an end to sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Has that happened? No. Will that happen during the tribulation? No. That's all going to happen at the end. And stepping into that wonderful thing I call, we call the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. God finishes the transgression. He makes an end to sin during this period of time. Antichrist is destroyed. God makes reconciliation. And I love it. I told you earlier, he brings everlasting, everlasting righteousness to this world in his everlasting kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He seals up the visions. Remember we mentioned that last week, the dreams and the prophecies. We're not going to need visions, dreams, and prophecies. We're going to have full knowledge. That will be fun. And he anoints the holy of holies. And we talked briefly last week about that. There will be a tabernacle. There will be a temple set up during the millennial reign. Ezekiel makes that very clear from, fifth, from 40 to 46 chapters. He's talking about the millennial reign here, folks, in 24. No doubt in my mind about it. This kingdom of Jesus Christ. The everlasting righteousness. The permanent righteousness. I, I can't even grasp that. What an incredible prophecy Daniel was given here. And you and I get it because Daniel wrote it down. What a, an incredible thing God has done given Daniel. Daniel thought the 70 years was it. No, Daniel, it's not going to be it. i got to tell you what's going to happen. And he does through Gabriel. I'm going to close there, but I want to just encourage you folks. What about us? What, are, what, what, what should we be doing? Well, I think we should do a couple of things. First of all, let's strive personally, individually, for godliness. We have a wonderful God. He asks us to be faithful and true because He is. And as a local body of believers, let's do the very same thing. We're going to strive for godliness as a church, as a local church. And of course, Paul wrote to us and, and he said, you know, Bruce, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's called you to do these things. Walk in a manner worthy of that calling. Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you walk, when you're doing, when you're talking, when you're working, when you're preaching, when you're teaching, whatever you're doing, are you doing it for Christ's sake? Or are we doing it for the world's sake? No. It's for Christ's sake. He tells us to do certain things. 
We got to do it. We should be doing it. We should want to do it. And we saw in, in Bible school this morning, we hear about these Christians that have come in, in Iran. And the, what the one guy was asked, well, what's the difference between Christians in the North America and Iran? He says, well, Christians in, in North America have no problem living for Christ. But the Christians in Iran have no problem living for Christ or dying for Christ. For his sake. Yeah. So our prayer should be this. When Jesus comes back, and he is, will, be, will we be found faithful? And I trust as your pastor, we can all say together, yes, we will be faithful. No matter what happens, times are going to get worse and worse and worse. I thought you were going to preach and teach on uh, escapism, Bruce. I do. I do. I do. But everything we should be, everything we do should be for Christ's sake. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you again for your precious word. Thank you, Father, for Daniel. Thank you for giving us this prophecy through Daniel and Gabriel. And may we live up to it. May we strive for godliness and holiness. And not just for our sake, Father, but for your sake. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and being cut off. Thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for rising up again. And we look forward, Father, Jesus, to being with you for eternity. And we will forever sing your praises. And it will be for your sake. And I pray these things for your sake. Amen. Amen.